Bitcoin culture has shifted. The balance of power is shifting from the Bitcoin fundamentalists to the Bitcoin builders. Bankless Nation, it is the second Friday of May. I hope you're ready for what, David? The Bankless Friday Weekly Roll-Up, where we cover the entire weekly news in crypto. Say it with me, which is always an ambitious endeavor. I almost <laughs> forgot that line. Yet we persevere nonetheless into the frontier. David's How's trying going, to make Ryan? that a thing. David it's definitely to make that a thing, thing by Always now. an people, ambitious people endeavor, but we persevere nonetheless. Into the frontier. Yeah, nonetheless. Yeah. Topics of the week. We got meme coin season. I've been sleeping <laughs> on this one, David, but you tell me why it's important. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm the man to do it, but I will anyways. Uh, crypto, <laughs> can we not find product market fit? Well, let's just go back to trading memes. Uh, that was yeah, the theme of not? the week. Uh, we that meme was so powerful that even Bitcoin caught the shitcoin bug this week, uh, leading to a change in the balance of power in Bitcoin culture, which is actually a more significant oh. topic that I do care about. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, of the big news of the week, uh, even though there's so much more than this, Brad Sherman has a hot take for crypto. Did you see this one, Ryan? I did. And you're going to love it, Bankless Nation. Uh, it's a, a perfect <laughs> soundbite to encapsulate what's going on in our halls of Congress these days yeah. when they talk about this silly thing called crypto. And we're going to get right to it, guys. But before we do, we want to tell you about our friends and sponsors over at Swell. This is a decentralized staking network specializing in the staking of ETH. David, tell them about Swell. Swell is a liquid staking provider. We know we know what these things are, the LSD sector. Um, but Swell is, if what would you do if you built a LSD provider in the year 2023? So not only is it a brand new DAO to spin up to build a brand new staking protocol, uh, but it also hooks more natively into DeFi, uh, doubling up where you can get sources of yield from. Uh, and so if you are interested in getting some extra both DeFi yield along with your ETH staking yield, Swell is the place for you. Uh, in their roadmap, they have the thing that really really gets me uh, going, which is DVT, aka squad staking uh, as well. Uh, and they want you to know that they have a voyage towards decentralization, which is starting soon TM. Uh, so app.swellnetwork.io slash voyage or the link in the show notes if you just want to go click uh, to get started. Yeah. And one of my favorite things about this, David, is there is 0% fees mm -hmm. for stakers who stake now. And of course, um, gas fees being high, just means stakers Yields. get more rewards. Yields. So yield goes up. Good time to uh, to be staking these days. Yeah. All right, David, uh, tell me about a good time or a bad time in the markets. Let's get to the price of Bitcoin this week. Uh, we are experiencing, Ryan, as we recorded, the saddest time of the week so far this week. Uh, prices uh -oh. are the lowest at the time of recording, Thursday morning Eastern time. Uh, Bitcoin is at the low, low price of $27,200. Started the week at 29000 Four hundred dollars. We are down seven point five percent. Not not a great week. Not so a great we lost week. all of our May gains, huh? We're back to April twenty yeah. third. We're, so. we're back to April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at this on the Kraken Pro charts, of course. How about ETH price? Is that a similar story or any good it news is here? Down exactly seven point five percent, just like wow. just like Daddy Bitcoin. Yeah. So it started at nineteen fifty, right. currently at eighteen ten. Well, you know, I'm going to ask you what's going on. And I think you've got some analysis here coming up, David, because mm -hmm. uh, I, I want your take on this, uh, take on the charts. But before we get there, Bitcoin ratio, ratio to ETH the ratio, <laughs> ratio flat. flat. It's no good. news there. <laughs> no. How about uh, crypto market cap? 1.16 down to 1.1 does not feel great. Uh, I remember a couple weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, you were like, I'm ready to to start to be ready to wave the white flag on triple digit ETH. And I was like, hold yeah. on, this could be the <laughs> middle of the year top. Uh, so far, the middle of the year top thesis is correct for three weeks in a row. Um, yeah, this one. So are you this, getting so, nervous? Uh, I, I mean, okay. Are you asking me, do I feel emotionally nervous? Like almost never. No. Are yeah. there reasons to be concerned? Yeah. Yeah. There are reasons to be concerned. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying are to separate, like, I'm never nervous. So like, if you ask me if I'm nervous, like the answer is going to be no. However, okay, different yes, question if I then. put on my short-term hat, it's like, yeah, there's reasons to be concerned. What's the probability that we get to that triple-digit ETH again? Well, as we've gotten so, so far, the 7.5% lower this week has we increased that probability by a comparable <laughs> amount. Um, Come on. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question, but I mean, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I was, I, I, I was like 60% earlier that, that it could happen again, that we'd revisit right. um, triple digit. And then that kind of decreased 
I think with the beginning of this year right. and we haven't seen the like the hit as that we we've thought, gotten but, further away from it right but this is but this is also the thing I was most worried about is that kind of that apathy season of the market right. Um, what's interesting is we'll talk about this later. We're going to talk about uh, meme coins mm-hmm. and whether that's just injecting new blood or whether that's injecting recycled capital. Um, right. Maybe we should talk about that in, in a minute. But this number to me is interesting. We're still above a trillion, even despite yes. this. And Brad Sherman hates that number. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. He actually yeah. named a <laughs> trillion dollars in in the video quote they're going to play a little bit later. But um, tell me about the market news, okay, sure. David? Why are prices down? Prices are down. <laughs> Because liquidity, oh, first before we get there, uh, Ryan, happy one year anniversary to the Terra Luna clash, crash. Deploying more capital, steady lads, that famous tweet that got tweeted out by Do Kwan, that was one year ago this week. So happy anniversary to those who I celebrate, do not celebrate I this. You don't celebrate, I do not celebrate, celebrate this, this anniversary. No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. It's okay. not a holiday in my book. Well, books. either way, anniversary nonetheless. Uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, the big reason as to what is going on in the market this week um, is that the idea has circulated that both Jump and Jane Street, which are big market makers, have scaled back their market making operations in the crypto world. Uh, and so here is a tweet that went viral and it's showing um, a Binance liquidity, order book liquidity. And you can just see the thinness of the order book in the narrow spreads, right? So the, what we're looking at are very narrow snapshots of both uh, Bitcoin price um, uh, a long time ago uh, in January of this year, so not that long ago, versus now. Uh, and so the, th- the the order books are thin um, in the, in, so like it doesn't take as much money to move the markets. And we all have learned the lesson that when you pull liquidity out of the markets, asset prices go down. And so Jump and Jane Street, very big players, um, have been alleged. I don't think I, we've seen a confirmation of this, but they are scaling back their market making operations as a result of regulatory fears. Uh, and so when liquidity exits the markets, uh, it's easier to push price down. It's easier to be fearful. Uh, and they also are ha- having their own sell pressure. Liquidity, lack of liquidity is bearish. Uh, and so that is the thing that has happened. That, that, that's why the market seems to have entered a new phase lately. The market's behaving differently. Uh, and uh, people are speculating that it's because liquidity has been pulled out. And behaving differently in that it's like more volatile or more like little bumps in the night send it spiraling and yeah. you know, positive. Emphasis news. towards the downside, no momentum okay. towards the upside. Any any uh, positive price action just immediately gets sold off. Uh, there was a there was a phase change in the market, and it happened recently. Um, and yeah. people are crediting the exiting of of market makers to this. Interesting. This this yeah. may be the apathy market I was talking about earlier. What, what is this showing us here? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a graph of liquidity in the market, which is the blue line, and you can see some events that have happened recently. So the Silvergate bank failure was uh, followed by a large decline in liquidity of Binance in Binance, Bitcoin to United to Bitcoin to Tether uh, liquidity, uh, then followed by um, the Binance CFTC charge. Uh, and then also a, a Binance bot fees increase is, is what's indicated here. But really, it's, it was a Silvergate bank. So the, this is a, a largely TradFi, the crypto banks, um, as uh, who called them, Gary Gensler called them the crypto banks, even though we use crypto banks to call it Coinbase and Kraken. The trad banks that service crypto customers all crashed and went under. And so these are the banking providers that also provide banking services to market makers. And so it's harder to market make in crypto these days. So liquidity is drying out of the system. And so I tweet out this tweet. Uh, everyone knows who's a bankless listener. Everyone knows that I'm a huge fan of SpongeBob, bigger fan of SpongeBob <laughs> than you are, bankless listener. Uh, and so this is the, the water, Sandy, water. Uh, he needs water, like crypto markets. We need water, we need liquidity. Otherwise we're bearish. So the state of the crypto markets right now is dry. Dry. We, we, are we have dry. no liquidity. We are bone dry right now, yeah. which yeah. Uh, which does not bode well for price. Right? There's not a lot of buyers um, stepping in under this, uh, you know, seventeen hundred dollar mm-hmm. ETH price. Right. Yeah. If you scroll down, I give a little bit of an autopsy. Right. And so one year ago, Terra blew up fifty billion dollars. Six months ago, FTX blew up fifteen fifteen billion dollars. Alameda, a market maker, ceased operations one month ago. Three crypto bank fails. This last week the largest bank failure since 2008. Regional banks, which do offer services to crypto, the crypto industry, uh, are getting slammered. Meanwhile, we are the Operation Choke Point 2.0. Choke Point, they're choking liquidity. Gary, Gary Gensler is pointing a gun at us. And I'm, what I'm saying is like, we don't get bullishness until liquidity returns. And then the crazy thing, Ryan, is somehow in the midst of all of this, 
uh, fucking Pepe coin gets to one point <laughs> five billion dollars. That's all inside money. This? That's not real. That's not outside money. That's not new buyers. That's all <gasps> inside money playing around. We'll, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But okay, I think this is actually a big story, D- David. I think this is a theme of the apathy market. It's b- just bone dry. And I think this is probably something we'll be talking about a lot over the coming weeks and, and months is when is the liquidity going to come back and mm. how does it come back? Where are the net new buyers of our crypto assets? That's the big question right now. And I think that is the appropriate question right. at this stage of the market where like the worst news, all of the kind of the like impact of SBF and Alameda and Terra and Celsius and three hours capital, that's all hit us. And now we're on the other side of that. And we're just like, well, we still don't have the use cases to attract new buyers. And right. so it's quiet. <laughs> you know, like that's what's going on. Uh, the, uh, the trillions of dollars of latent capital that's still out there, which we need. And we are doing Pepe coin. <laughs> <laughs> you mean they're not buying this stuff, huh? Um, no. Somebody They're is, looking though. at Somebody us and like, oh, the cryptocurrency industry was needed to professionalize and come into the light and like provide good products and services, they just created Pepe coin and Elon Musk is tweeting out about Miladies. Like, yeah, you know, you know, it, Gary Gensler is like, excellent. This is exactly <laughs> what I wanted to see. He's loving this right now. Um, well, let's talk about a good side of the equation, yes. which is holders are still holding. Holders are holding. I, I feel that very strongly, right? We don't have new buyers. We don't have new liquidity entering the market. But we have some indications we're that the still holders here. are holding. <laughs> we're still here. And what are we doing? We're staking. We're staking. What are you looking at on the screen here? What's the story around ETH staking in the numbers here? The story around ETH staking, Ryan, I'm so glad you brought this up. I'm glad you asked. We are at an all-time high in amount of ETH are staked to Ethereum. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. How long did it take? Less than one month of time. Less for, than a month. Less, less than a month. Remember they told us. Remember they told us when withdrawals were enabled, it was going to just like crater. Like all of this staked ETH was going to drain out of the system, and we would totally crater. And less than a month later, we're already at all time highs of staked ETH. So that means inflows has exceeded outflows. I was not expecting this so quickly. I thought we'd we'd have a more sustained dip. I mean, I was bullish, but I wasn't like, if you told me like within 30 days, we'll be at all-time highs again, mm-hmm. I've been like, eh, I mean, three months maybe, I could see sure. that, but like I 30 days, that's I fast. I wouldn't gamble a significant amount of money that we will be at all-time highs inside of one month. So yes, this is a yeah. bullish outcome of this. Uh, I, the general Ethereum community member thought leader take was that like, this is not a bearish event. Yes, there will be a net outflow, but it will quickly, the gap will quickly be, um, covered by net new inflow because of the risk off. Like that was the Ethereum consensus. And like, by I'm the way, that's say, what you said. That's what in I a said with Jordy Alexander. Okay. David if does the bank not like to will his please own go horn. back to the Jordy Alexander, <laughs> David Hoffman debate and look at who and who made what points. I'm David, sorry. <laughs> I, you said you weren't going to victory lap. I was supposed to victory lap for you. Okay. <laughs> David won that debate. I think Jordy Alexander, the evidence is, Jordy Alexander took down um, a, a Terra, Terra bull, Luna, yeah. a Terra Luna in his debate, Hand, single-handedly. While everyone else thought that he got smashed because they were all lunatics. Yes, but then you did a debate with Jordy on whether the mm-hmm. uh, ETH withdrawals would be bullish or bearish. Right. And uh, jo- Jordy's thesis would well, a lot of ETH would actually drain out of the system. I think David wins this round. But so I'm going to do okay, the so- victory laugh for you. I'll give a point to Jordy, which is like the price of ETH currently is marginally lower than at the time of the debate. But I'll say all of ETH Ether price action is completely related to exogenous factors. There you go. But all the, uh, all the uh, but this is the point I want that. to make. All the internal points about the Ethereum network and about Ethereum fundamentals, the Ethereum community has been right on the right side of history every single incident of drama about Ethereum. Remember ETH proof of work? Remember the ETH overhang and and dump into the market fear mongers like uh, remember like uh, like I don't know every time any Ethereum event has caused drama the people about Ethereum who know about Ethereum have always been right almost every single time there it is folks there's the there's the victory lap but honestly. <laughs> I mean, I can't, like, that's kind of right. Here's Superfizz here saying in 2020, the Beacon Chain launch that was December 2020, uh, 2022, September, proof of stake replaced proof of work 
the merge. Then in April of 2023, withdrawals from staking were enabled. And now those who wish to withdraw completed the action. That happened on May 7th. That's when mm. the uh, withdrawal queue was emptied. It was flushed. And we started yeah. to see mm-hmm. inflow flows again. Um, pretty yeah. impressive to see it laid out in this timeline. Here's another mm-hmm. ETH bull, Anthony Sasano saying, there are now more active validators live on the Ethereum network than there were before staking withdrawals were enabled. It took less than a month for this to happen. ETH staking is up only. All time high. Give that one a like. Give that one a like. That deserves a like. Uh, Anthony Sazano, one of the also perpetually correct about Ethereum. Perpetually correct about Ethereum. I love that you just said that right now. Um, He he doesn't need me to convince him of that. Uh, Let's let's zoom out. Um, Kraken Mm -hmm. actually put out a great report this week on kind of the overall state of staking. Yeah. And of course, Ethereum isn't the only proof of stake network. Did yeah, you know th- this David, report is about staking, staking as, a, in general. as an industry? So some stats that I found interesting, $288 billion is the market cap of the top uh, 35 proof of stake assets. Um, so that's growing 49% quarter on quarter. Uh, the value of stake uh, assets. Just for just for uh, context, two hundred eighty-eight yes. billion is the total market cap. Uh, two hundred and twenty billion of that is Ethereum. Oh, okay. Well, there you yeah, go. Just a wanna, lot. Just a wanna, lot is Ethereum. Just right want to make sure Ethereum gets its credit right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, b- b- bankless <laughs> listeners. No, we don't give Ethereum enough credit around here. Uh, Sixty-eight billion dollars. The value of staked assets. Um, Five billion annualized staking rewards. It's mm-hmm. it's a pretty big industry at this point, yeah. right? It's, the value it's of all large. staking it's rewards very large. is five billion. Yeah, um, that's twenty three percent. Proof of stake is twenty three percent of the total crypto market uh, right. cap. I imagine that's largely ETH. Here's one thing that's interesting: the the average yield is eleven point six percent, and of course, Ethereum skews that way downward. So other yeah. proof of stake networks are. Um, rewarding are distributing a lot more of their supply than ether a lot higher issuance <laughs> i think there's reasons for that a lot higher inflation uh, yeah you could tell we're coming off of justin drake monday episode too right because yeah, you yeah, know yeah, yeah. we got we got great, some bullish takes on ETH this episode. week yeah you know let, let's switch though to the conversation uh, actually just we were, to, okay ryan what do you yeah. think in the last um seven days what do you think was the uh, staking reward for ether in the last seven days, are you talking about like a annualized percentage? Yes, or annualized number? percentage. Annualized percentage. Yeah. Was well, four point four point five? Mm, like this? No, that was just from issuance. That's just issuance. Okay, you're yeah. talking okay, about no, transaction fees totally and NED. Three point eight percent APY from issuance. If you get add on the tips and also the MEV, you come up to six point six percent on your ETH. It has been a great time to be a validator. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely good. That yield mm-hmm. generated in uh, ETH denominated returns is always mm-hmm. quite nice. Mm-hmm. Um, David, this is a question I think that came off of our market section last week, asking about. Um, I mean, we're critical from time to time on the mm-hmm. Fed, on Jerome Powell, on uh, interest rates. Here's a question from Steve F. ETH. I missed the cutoff this week, but my question for Team Bankless for next uh, weekly roll-up is the following, and I ask this with true respect for you guys. Uh, thanks, Steve. You don't have to respect us, though. Since <laughs> Bankless consistently criticizes the federal interest rate policy fairly and is calling for a pivot, what terminal interest do you think the Federal Reserve sh- should settle on? So this listener is calling mm-hmm. us out, David, and if mm-hmm. you're going to criticize the interest rate, right. you have to te- you have to you say, have to say why. what you think it should be. You have to say why. What's What's your response to this? Um, My response is like, uh, the only reason why I'm not calling for a pivot, except my, my portfolio is (laughs) you, you, me (laughs) as a human person who's living in an economy and lives in a society, I am not calling for a pivot. My portfolio would love a pivot. There's two Davids. (laughs) He wants a pivot for his bags. Yeah. My bags want a pivot. Uh, What is the appropriate interest rate? No clue. God, I do not want any one job inside of the Federal Reserve. I do not want Powell's job. Uh, I don't have an opinion on this matter. And so um, I apologize for bankless listeners if, it th- if we have given off the air of like, we think that we are right about interest rates and that we want to pivot. We're just, we're, this is an industry and all you guys also have risk on crypto assets. So don't <laughs> you, pretend that you, you also, also don't want to pivot. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I would zoom out though, and I would say uh, I I agree with that, and I'm glad you clarified, right? So, mm-hmm. um, a pivot is good for crypto bags. Is it good for society? Is is mm-hmm. kind of a different question. But um, he, here's where I'd zoom out, and I do have some criticism uh, for the Fed that that I think is uh, more more fair over the long run. 
as you said, David, no one really knows what the mm-hmm. real interest rate should be. No one, not even maybe God knows, maybe God knows, right? So this was actually a, a point. This was, this was a point that was made by Edward Chancellor in our yeah. recording. By the way, guys, there is an episode coming out with oh, yeah, a financial out, yeah. historian, so good. Edward Chancellor. So it's coming good. out, I think, on Monday. Mm-hmm. And if you want the more nuanced, non-bag bias take on the Fed and what they should be doing, what they should have done, rather than what they are doing, listen to that take. But he makes the point that um, no one knows the real interest rate, of course, that a hypothetical real interest rate exists. But the best tool we have of finding out what the real interest rate is, is free markets. Mm -hmm. And we're in this mess because central bankers have distorted free markets so badly for so long, and they've pretended that it's all okay. And so I don't know, neither did Edward Chancellor know what the actual rate should be. Maybe God does. No human alive on earth, no AI on earth knows this, but we do know that the rates, the fake rates over the last 10 years were dumb, like real dumb. Real I dumb. mean, negative? We went negative in, right. in, in uh, you know, some, like zero percent, close to zero percent in the US. So I, if I'm Powell, I don't know if I can fix this. Mm-hmm. And there, there's an element of Powell, I think you made this point last week, where he's just a wheel in, in the cog, right? This is right. the wheel of history. What else can he do? He's got the, the uh, hand that he's been dealt. He's got to he, play those hands. He's not outside of the system. He's inside of the right. system. So the criticism, though, is the system and the way it's been right. uh, managed. Right. And uh, the fix, I think we're pretty, cer- like, much more certain on this. The fix is individuals need an escape hatch, an mm-hmm. alternative store of value, like, why would you put your money in treasuries? Why would you put your money in the dollar, right? So for the individual, I'm like, well, crypto is a great escape hatch for that. And I think as a collective, we need a check on the central banker power. As a collective, we also need crypto, right? And it provides that escape hatch so that central bankers have less power um, mm-hmm. over the, uh, the future. But again, if you want the real perspective on this from a true financial non-bag bias historian, uh, the episode coming at you on Monday. It was uh, it was one of my favorite episodes that we've recorded recently, actually. I, I really enjoy Edward. Yeah. One of the reasons why the weekly roll-up episodes always go so long is because we find little rabbit holes to talk about, and then I also want to talk about it, so I'll give my take as well. <laughs> uh, so like the, the whole idea of this episode is that interest rates are a naturally emergent phenomenon, so the concept of a set interest rate by mere mortals, mere humans, is not real. It's fake. We're arbitrarily picking a number when yeah. nature, mother nature, or why you said only God knows what the ought, uh, ought to be interest rate ought to be. It's like when we pick a number, it's a, we create a fake world. And when we pick a low number, we are, create, we are perpetuating that fake world and making it even faker. And that has been like my, our entire lifetimes as millennials, we've been living in a fake world uh, because interest rates have been low for more or less our entire lifetimes. And now like we have to come to terms with that. And so now we got to jack up the interest rates to pay our debts that society has been paying uh, for decades prior to our even acknowledging of the problem. And so the release valve, like you said, is, is crypto assets. And so uh, the only reason why the Fed can create that fake world is because there's no escape valve to escape towards until Bitcoin comes in 2009. Uh, and here we are in history. There. David said Bitcoin that time, not Ethereum. Uh, I'm proud of you, David. That's <laughs> great. Welcome. I don't own anything. Speaking, Bitcoin. though, of Ethereum <laughs> and being bullish on Ethereum. Okay, one last thing. We got to go over it in the market section. This was a fantastic report. One of the best I've seen analyzing and predicting the price of Ether. David, I know mm. you haven't had a chance to read this. Yeah. But let me tell you, I am so bullish. I want to invite these analysts uh, on. And um, this is a report put out by Van Eck. So analyzing Ether from an institutional perspective and throwing out price predictions based on the thing, like based on total, actually understanding the asset, which is so bullish to me. So they're doing, they have a, a base case, a bear case, and a bull case by 2030, okay? And the way they are calculating this is based on Ethereum's total revenue. So it's 2.5 billion annualized today. And they have a base case projection of 50 billion annualized per year by 2030, right? That's their base case. Their bear case is lower. Their bull case is 136 billion per year. And the way they calculate those numbers is from, as we learned uh, in our Justin Drake episode, um, congestion, which is ETH gas fees, 
and also contention, which mm. is MEV. And also this thing that they call Ethereum security as a service, which is the idea of using ETH, restaking that, ETH. They have restaking in this yes. report? Are you serious? Yes. Yes, and I just want to point out, like, of wow. course, this is Good for a projection. Them. This is like, this is right, not right, necessarily right. what the future, be- like, these numbers. Well, it's, their, it's their job but to produce these. They got the variables right. That's yes. what I'm so bullish on. It's not another stupid institutional analyst Does report. It, it, so you're, you're 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 actually just like, I don't care about the numbers. The fact that they don't got the variable, the, the inputs into the models is, is yes. like we're at finally at that point in the history. Yes. That, yes. that institutions are getting the inputs right. They actually are understanding how to value this asset class. And uh-huh. it's taken like three to four years of education. I actually feel like Bankless has been a big like, we part of been, that. that is where we came it, from. Like... <laughs> But but this report gets it right. And by the way, it doesn't yeah. also uh, include kind of monetary premium on top of this because yes. I think you could argue Ooh, that's very you difficult. That. You can't measure that. But that's like, not a variable. I don't know. If I'm an institutional uh, investor and I'm reading this report and I'm seeing these numbers so clearly laid out, right? Like it just makes so much sense. And it's right. not a meme coin style right. of like pull it out of your ass number. Uh, anyway, bullish on institutions, analysts actually understanding this asset. It's very cool. I am offended that their base case for Ether in 2030 is merely $12,000, but then you made the point that they didn't add in monetary premium, which is yes. the, way, the right way to analyze that is it's a multiplier. It's like, how strong do you want the multiplier to be? If it's extremely moneyness, it's like a 10x. If it's not very moneyness, it's like a 1.5x. Uh, so then adding the money multiplier onto it, which I think is strong, 5x. Pulling that one out sure. of my ass. Uh, totally. <laughs> but, but, but you can pull that. You can pull that right. wherever you like, wherever you right. want to pull that from. Because that's what money is. Anyone's guess. Right. Yes. Yeah, yes. Very much. Okay. That's the meme value of it. Anyway, okay. Let's bullish on. on that. <laughs> we got to move on. What do we got coming up next? Coming up next, meme coin season. My favorite season. I'm lying. Uh, Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin <laughs> catches the shit coin bug because the <laughs> meme coin season was so strong that the virus has spread to Bitcoin. But... Uh, you know how like uh, when you you catch a virus and like you can actually like change it like can mess with your DNA. That's yeah. what happened in Bitcoin this week. Bitcoin oh. culture is shifting. The balance of power is shifting from the Bitcoin fundamentalists to the Bitcoin builders, the the tribe that I resonate with. I'm pretty sure you also resonate with. Yes, uh, yes. So we'll talk about that as well. And then Brad Sherman's got that a hot take like we talked about, and I made a meme of him. And so we're going to talk about all of that <laughs> and did. more. But first, a moment to talk about these fantastic sponsors, including Kraken, our preferred crypto exchange for 2023, the people that made that staking report, which you should also go check out. And if you don't have an account with Kraken, why not click the link in the show notes? Here we go. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning-fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. If you haven't experienced the superpowers that a smart contract wallet gives you, check out Ambire. Ambire works with all the EVM chains that are out there, the layer twos like Arbitrum, Optimism, and Polygon, but also the non-Ethereum chains like Avalanche and Phantom. Because of the power of smart contract wallets, Ambire lets you pay for gas in stable coins, meaning you'll never have to spend your precious ETH again. The web app has numerous fiat on-ramps to make it easy to dump your fiat for crypto. And if you like self-custody, but you still want training wheels, you can recover a lost Ambire wallet using an email password, but without giving the Ambire team any control over your funds. Check it out at ambire.com for the web app experience. But also, the Ambire mobile wallet is coming soon for both iOS and Android. And if you want to be a beta tester, you can sign up at ambire.com slash app. And since you stayed to the very end of this ad read, you should know that Ambire is airdropping its wallet token to early users for simply just using the wallet. So if you want to get started with Ambire, all the links that you need are in the show notes. It's meme coin season. We're going to find out what that means. Here's a question that Bankless Twitter put out. Have you bought a meme coin in the past month? I have not answered this question. I don't know if you have, David, but why don't you tell us, have you bought a meme coin in the past month? Uh, If you scroll down, you'll see my answer. Let me see. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
you got a, a gif of like a, a, a guy a who's of, like sheepishly nodding. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. she was, you have. So you have. Yes. So I've bought, I've bought uh, you are one coins. of the degens here. Yeah, I've, I've bought two okay. mean coins. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what you say is um, going to be given with 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 love or uh, wait, do you do you have bitterness that these weren't your meme coins that uh, that pumped David? No, I just I'm bitter eat? that I'm compelled to play the game just like everyone else because that's the meta where we you are. You don't right have now. to. You could just. It's fine. It. It's you know you you miss one hundred percent of the shots you don't take. You know, I have uh, ignored it so far. But why don't you tell us what's happening? So here's the first uh, tweet we're we're teeing up here. Yeah. Okay. So this is of course Pepe Coin. This this started off by Pepe Coin. Uh, uh, launched uh, the sixteenth of April. Uh, one point five billion dollar market cap as of today. Hit one point seven earlier. Uh, one hundred twenty two thousand people wallets have traded Pepe at least one point in their lives. Um, this stories for how these tokens just sort of like rocket out of corners of the internet into billion dollar market caps are always inherently dark and, uh, dark. Just also, yeah. just like, uh, hard to illuminate. Not, not dark, like oh, evil, okay. but just like, okay. Uh, uh, mysterious. Opaque. Opaque. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. They, they come from like, I'm sure they start with like, tr- uh, trading circles, you know, back channel alpha Some telegram. Yeah. So, someone and... like figures out how to make something catch. I'm pretty sure that Pepe is just a freaking token and is just called Pepe. There's no utility to this thing. It is it's just Pepe, a co- the frog. Pepe meme. the frog. Yes. So okay. like the, just... this one token got minted and birthed and somehow somebody got the market to accept that this is the appropriate the token that correlates with right the now. internet meme. And now because yeah. it got to $1.5 billion, it now is. So this it's thing is like sufficiently point. large and the memes and owners around this are sufficiently big and people have made sufficient amounts of money that this is now like Doge is about the Doge meme and Pepe is about the Pepe meme. And now we have okay. a new meme coin. Look at this chart, David. Okay, so you're telling me this thing was valued at... Uh, zero. zero. It was valued wait, at let zero me, let me switch when it to market started. Cap. About zero, of course, yes. but like reasonably when it got some liquidity, uh, I mean, first kind of days of liquidity, 77 right. million in market cap. And this thing got to 1.8, 1.8 billion. billion dollars. Yeah. So $1.8 billion was just created out of nowhere, uh, inside of one month. Okay. This must've minted uh, some millionaires there. There's always yes. some winners from these yes. Pepe coins. Yeah. Here's a, a chart we're looking at. Top three dudes. We don't know if these are dudes to be they're fair. Dudes. have made $14 dudes, million. Dollars. I will bet my entire net worth that these are dudes. <laughs> the dudes. <laughs> okay. Uh, three of them made over $14 million mm-hmm. on Pepe. And yes, they did cash out. That's why I was about right. to ask. These are people you that were have used sold. as their yes. exit liquidity. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So well, the, the nice. number one uh, profit tier of Pepe made a 9x. Yeah. The number two made a 14x. Number three made a 4,786x. So they basically put zero capital at stake and bought no to- like all the tokens at very little price and then managed to hold it all the way up. Yeah. Imagine making $14 million dollars just it's from so stupid dumb i mean point. like it's part of this industry it's like yeah we have our new money printers and like yeah i guess this is like the logical conclusion of it and i do appreciate that this tweet says here's the pefe profits leaderboard this is a casino like this is a leaderboard there are winners and losers here there are net net winners because there's 1.5 billion dollars of wealth that's now on paper um but it is a game that people are playing well, here's the game. I mean, we could see it kind of the, the peak, at least so far, right. unless this has right. a resurgence, was on May 5th at mm-hmm. $1.8 billion. And now we're down to, back down to uh, 700 closer million. to 600, and f- yeah, $700 yeah. million yeah. Dollars at this point in time. So who are the losers? Yeah, I mean, it's like well, the losers kind are of the people a, that have bought in since May 5th. If you've bought since I, May 5th, you are a loser. Yes. Sorry. Uh, you bought too late. Sorry. Yes. Um, in the, in this local time frame. Was Pepe up. one of the coins that you, because uh, there, there are many Pepe's of these not, meme coins, right? There's, yeah, now, now there's a Cambrian explosion of meme coins because it's meme coin season and everyone's like, people got a 50,000x, uh, Where what's the next meme coin that also gets you a 50,000x? So now now it's meme coin casino season. So there's like season, dogs, that's, there's a, yeah, like, what, yeah. what else is there? I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I, I bought, attention. one of my friends sent me a, a contract a contract address on Arbitrum and <laughs> I didn't even look, dude. <laughs> this is the next Pepe and you're just like, oh, okay. I don't care. I don't care. I didn't look into it. I'm like, all right. 
<laughs> whatever. I mean, it's fine if it's a very small amount of money, right? right? And this is what yeah. people want to do because they're bored in the bear market. Okay. It, it saddens me when people like uh, get serious about this mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> gamble away their life savings, but they're free to do that. Yep. Um, what analysis are we looking at here? Uh, okay, so these are just more stats uh, from Pepe. So like I said, 122,000 distinct wallets. Uh, top five to six wallets listed here are all MEV bots. So you want to know the real winners of the casino games, Ryan? I, MEV I know bots. Oh, MEV really? bots, yeah. How about ETH holders? Because they paid some uh, MEV to ETH holders and also um, burnt yes. some gas on yes. this. Yes, if you don't know how to run an MEV bot, and well, it's it's harder to say the ETH holders are the winners here. It's all, they're always... ETH holders are always the house, but right now MEV bots are first in being the house. Um, gotcha. It's more it's more assured, and also there's fewer of them. Specifically, this one MEV bot, um, Jared from Subway.eth. Uh, if Bankless <laughs> listeners don't know who that is, it's um, it is the MEV bot that sandwich attacked Wintermute um, inside of oh, the same. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh huh. Jared from Subway. I didn't yeah, know he Jared was doing Jared from this Subway now. is up to some shenanigans on the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, Jared yeah. from subway.eth. And you can mm-hmm. see it all, all, all on chain. Here's a, a, a story here that says, in less than three months, Jared reaped over $40.6 million in revenue with a profit of $6 million. Mm-hmm. So Jared from Subway is just uh, raking it in by running these bots. He's got right. to program them, run them himself, uh, him, th- themselves, and and is uh, making money on these, these I guess, mm-hmm. MEV arbitrage types of opportunities, right? Exactly right. So yeah, total revenue, $40.6 million, paid $34 million in gas fees, which is why if you pull up ultrasound.money, the supply, the burn rate of ETH is just like cratering, or it's going up. The supply of ETH is just like going down bigly yeah. because MEV bots are paying such fi- fi- high fees to the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and, and so the $40 million of revenue has been turned into $34 Whoa, million. Dollars. Yeah, dude, it's been crazy. So Ethereum deflation is at three percent in the last seven days, which is crazy. Uh, go to go to the seven day time frame. Did we did we break ten thousand dollars or ten thousand ETH burnt per day? Are we at seventy thousand this week? Almost. We're at sixty seven point eight thousand. Okay. Uh, so Jared uh, from Subway the this infamous uh, sandwich attacker bot that is just printing cash, two hundred and thirty eight thousand sandwich attacks. Um, uh, attacking more than 106,000 oh, victims. Oh, I get it. Jared yeah. from Subway sandwich attack. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm just putting that together now. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. There you go. Slow. Uh, 98.3% of Jared's transactions are uh, sandwich attacks. Uh, and so um, so the the, the way that this works is that they, they uh, somebody, and the reason why this works is that these tokens are super illiquid. Uh, and so the, this is why that this is a game uh, is that there's uh, of the one point or now I guess it's $700 million of market cap. It's like resting on like 100, uh, like I think it's something like $20 million of liquidity. So there's only so much liquidity that's supporting this market cap. Uh, and so since these things are really illiquid, this is just a field day for MEV bots because everyone aping into these things without thinking about it and not doing their price controls and not using CalSwap uh, are getting uh, like sandwiched by Jared. Sandwiched by Jared. Uh, and so... <laughs> And so uh, he's, he's ins- inserting transactions ahead of these buyers to pump up the price, and then the, and then he's selling the transact the tokens right after people buy inside of the same block, just printing money. So he's doing this for Pepe, obviously, and then also he's got the wallet holds eight hundred tokens that Jared controls. So he's just doing this for the entire. Ethereum casino. And so there's this massive casino going on because of the shitcoin mania that's happening. And you're right when you say that the Ether holders are the house, but Jared from Subway is front running us by doing MEV sandwich attacks, which it's the really- house. He, He's the really, dealer at he, the table taking a cut. <laughs> yes, yeah. so he, he is a rogue <laughs> dealer that is under the table like moving cards around and then instead of the casino making money because Ethereum's a casino, the dealer's making the money. And so this yeah. really hammers home Justin, Justin Drake's MEV burn, why we need MEV burn because this one guy is taking all the money for himself instead of distributing it equally and fairly to all the Ether holders, which really yeah. in parts like why we need MEV burn. We want the sandwiches to go to the yeah, house. That's, that's we our want sub, casino Jared. money, Jared. Yeah, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, how dare you? But, I'd be a lot less bitter if that went to the <laughs> Ether holders. <laughs> You're pretty, but you sound pretty greedy, David, because uh, Ether has burnt a lot this week. I mean, that's yeah. been pretty good. Could have burnt more. You can always could've burnt more. Like twice well, as much. 
Let me ask you about this. Do you feel like um, moralizing about this? Are you kind of like, uh, meme coins are bad. Are you of the mindset that like, this is what's wrong with crypto. It's giving us a bad reputation. Now Gary Gensler has additional fodder and so does Brad Sherman. And they can go look at these millennials in their underwear, living in their parents' basement, trading these meme coins around. That's all crypto is good for. End of story. Are you like, are you mad about this or what's your take? Yeah, you, you're, you're, are you tapping into my slight... Uh spiciness attitude today i don't know i don't know like i, I actually i don't, I don't think know i don't think that's a wrong take okay um, the reason why i'm in crypto is because ethereum produces coordination platforms and one of the byproducts of that is shit coins and that's good and natural phenomenon i'm not going to moralize like you can't use my blockchain for your shit coins <laughs> it's a little bit frustrating that this is like now my third bear market and we do uh, the the whole thing. like funneling and capturing money and giving it to public goods and being able to coordinate around public goods and being able to produce like the sci-fi future of uh, human coordination and flourishing is in like we're still doing the Pepe coins. And so like there's a there's a reason why we didn't cover Pepe coins in our weekly live stream. It's just like. So I was we've done, done we've it. done this before. Like it. we did this in 2017. Yeah. We did this in, yeah. in 2021. Like we were doing it in 2023. Like how many times are we going to go around the sun and talk about why like, can't you be happy for coins? people who got really wealthy here? Because there's very few of them. There's a single leaderboard, and we know who they are. There's it, there's it's supposed to be everyone. It's supposed to be a systemic level. Yeah, not all boats. All boats did not rise. Pepe is not this. going to make the world. A more sustainable I get place. It. it is not my, a foundation take, for yeah. I get it. Like I, I would say though, one thing to quote you from last week is is ether money is a public good, and yeah. uh, this does go towards contributing yes. towards the economic security of Ethereum. Yeah. So there's that at least. My overall take is that this is just noise, and it I don't noisy. care about it. it and is I noisy. wish um, it's, it's a lot I'm, of noise. It is noisy. I know. I, I I would love to be able to channel this out and just like we're building, people are bored, so they're doing this. Yeah. Um, I think there's some narrative problems around it, but mostly this is just noise. I'm Let's not, not going to hate on the internet for doing weird internet things. I'm feeling funny today. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, the Bitcoin community because uh, yeah. Bitcoin's kind of feeling funny as well. Yeah. Bitcoin <laughs> transaction fees are up in good right. news. That's bullish because Bitcoin long-term does not have a way to sustain the economic right. budget uh, and the security budget of Bitcoin. So <laughs> transaction fees going up, transaction revenue going up is kind of bullish. But why mm -hmm. don't you tell us why transaction fees are going up? Uh, the innovation of the ERC-20 has migrated its way to Bitcoin. So using the Ordinals protocol, we now have BRC-20s, just because they're they're copycatting the name. They're actually, they're not like the ERC-20 token standard on Bitcoin, because that doesn't work. You don't take the ERC-20 standard and put it onto Bitcoin via ordinals. But the idea is that like, yeah, we're doing tokens on Bitcoin now. Uh, so using the ordinals protocol, we now have shit coins on Bitcoin. Uh, and so uh, it's it's more like the semi-fungible for the, the people who like the deeper takes, the semi-fungible ERC-115 uh, token standard. So... Uh, fungible tokens, but they're unique as well. Uh, and so there is now a BRC token page. There is now a unisat.io marketplace. So we have a marketplace for tokens on Bitcoin. Um, the first token is ORD, O-R-D-Y for ordinals. And so if you want to access uh, the unisat marketplace, you first need to buy a BRC20 with a unisat wallet, and then you need to mint 20 new inscriptions into Bitcoin ordinals. And the beautiful thing about it, so this is this is like the utility. What does an ordi token do, which is the first BRC20 on the ordinals protocol? It, it gives you access to the marketplace. So it's like a token-gated access to the marketplace. And so the thing is, like, the crazy thing that this is genius, Ryan, is what they did is that in order to access the marketplace, you had to mint 20 new BRC20 tokens. And so in order to even enter the access, enter the marketplace, you had to supply 20 new tokens into the market. Ah, and so, the, so the marketplace could have, there. yeah, you didn't, you didn't need to do anything with them. You just needed to, and so like what this did is this filled up the Bitcoin block space because everyone was minting BRC20 tokens because they wanted to access the Unisat marketplace. 
And so what did that do? It congested the Bitcoin blockchain. It got people talking about it. It went viral. Uh, people shared it on Twitter. Well, and now it became, it became a movement. Okay, so BRC20, the market cap of BRC20 tokens, mm -hmm. uh, 537 million. That's so, funny. It was uh, 700 million literally two hours ago when I made this. Agenda. I mean, as you would expect, that's 206 million in 24 uh, it, hour it hit volume. Over a billion earlier this week. Can I just ask real quick about the user experience of something like Unis, Unistat? Oh, you Unistat? can't ask me. I haven't used it. It, But it doesn't sound easy. This is not like MetaMask, yeah. connect, pay gas fee, right, 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 hit right, the button yeah. and swap. I mean, yeah. we really are maximizing the um, capability of yeah. this TI-83 calculator here. And people are getting really creative with it. Yeah. Uh, let me say you that. You can play but, Doom on the TI-83 calculator. Like, I, there's a lot left of juice to squeeze, I'd say, actually. Okay. Well, so um, this is a tweet from Eric Wall. This is a chart mm -hmm. of what happens when somebody correctly circuits the Ponzi wires. Yeah. What are we looking at here? And this is what I was, I was talking about. So these are uh, all of the marketplaces of Bitcoin, so Ordinals, Ordinal Swap, Ordinals Wallet, and then Unisats. And because of the uh, you must mint 20 BRCs in order to enter, the Unisat marketplace is just the by far the biggest one, right? It's crushing um, like Magic right? Eden, right? So, yeah. Okay, this is oh, the Unisat marketplace. So this is yeah. Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin, um, yeah. Exclusive. And then okay. the Ordi token recently got listed on a cent uh, centralized exchange, now on Gate. Uh, so we have Bitcoin tokens, Ryan. There's tokens hey. on Bitcoin <laughs> being traded on centralized exchanges, which is... I, I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. All right, so here's the chart of uh, the Ordi token. Ordi tokens, you're saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, it looks similar. It's not quite Pepe, but you know, it's got some uh, Two, similarities uh, $290 million market cap also just got minted in like the last, when did, it, when did that thing get started? Like in the last week. That's incredible. Okay, so denominated tell us- Denominated Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Yeah, this is a Bitcoin denominated token. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's bullish in a way, but, but tell me, mm -hmm. tell me about block space demand. So, okay. um, yeah. what so, are we looking at here? So this is two charts of ordinal inscriptions. So how many inscriptions there are made via the ordinals pro, uh, uh, protocol, uh, and then also fees paid over time, which is just like the highest spike I've ever seen on, on Bitcoin. So inscriptions, just is like one, um, uh, uh, creation of an ordinal creation of an ins inscription. There I'm not using the best one words. There was one day last week where um, uh, blockchain transaction fees on, on Bitcoin, transaction fees um, were larger than actual issuance, which I'm not sure that has ever Whoa. happened in the history of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yo, wow. Right? Wow. Wow, um, that's nuts. And then it went, all went to the miners and got sold. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we go. Um Daily fees, market look at fee that. share. Look at that. Okay, so fees, it, fees it's hard to up. articulate this for the podcast listeners, but daily fees is flat and then it's just vertical. It goes mm. so high so quickly. I've never seen a, para a parabola like that. And then this okay. next chart, Ryan. Okay, this is this is a crazy stat. This is a once, this has never, this is a new record for Bitcoin in its entire lifespan. The amount of unconfirmed transactions waiting to be confirmed in the Bitcoin mempool at the highest price. Oh my price God, look is, at this. Is, I did the one year. It is, has never been higher. Bitcoin has broken its own record in how long has Bitcoin been around? Thir 14 years, 13 years. We have never seen more pending transactions in Bitcoin ever, not even close because of ordinals. What, what's interesting here, so the, the mempool is getting clocked basically. So mm -hmm. this means transaction fees on Bitcoin have to be going up, right? Yes. And maybe we'll get to, to part of that story. But mm -hmm. this one uh, observation here is if you want to be a smart contract platform, you're going to have to deal with smart contract platform problems. Yeah. That's kind of what <laughs> this is, right? <laughs> That's such a good I line. mean, we talk about MEV. <laughs> we talk about, okay, where do the, the, the proceeds for crazy... Um, congestion fees go? Mm -hmm. Do they go to miners? They go to, or do we burn them to someone else? It's a same set of problems that Ethereum has had to mm -hmm. deal with because these are common problems to any programmable uh, blockchain. Mm -hmm. And with Taproot, the implementation of, of Taproot, Bitcoin yeah. became slightly programmable, just a little it's bit. just programmable bit. enough so, for some So it's shit starting coinery. to get these problems, <laughs> which is fascinating to me. Here is a yeah. tweet from Binance. We've temporarily closed Bitcoin withdrawals as the Bitcoin network is experiencing a congestion issue? <laughs> wow. Our team is working currently to fix uh, uh, until the network is stabilized. It will reopen Bitcoin withdrawals as soon as possible. I mean, fees going up, you know, $10 to tra transfer a Bitcoin. 
Uh, that's crazy. Here's the Ordinals Marketplace going crazy as well. Tell me about, though, this uh-huh. cultural change yeah. that this has caused or like some dissent in the ranks sure. of uh, Bitcoin supporters. What's, uh, what's your take on this so far? So we have uh, two main characters here, I'll say, uh, the good kind of main characters, Eric Wall and Nick Carter, who are coming on next Tuesday for the State of the Nation. I'm going to, I'm so excited for that episode. Uh, here's a meme of a dandelion, a weed just growing out of concrete. The concrete is Bitcoin maximalism. The weed is taproot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so Eric Wall is saying, uh, can you go back to the tweet? Eric Wall is saying, what happened today was the emergence of the BRC20 asset class. It wasn't an attack. It wasn't a DDoS. Taproot has just made it simple to productize the Bitcoin block space into any arbitrary protocol. Shitcoin trading protocols is an obvious buyer of that block space. And so he's saying the expressiveness that, that we've had on Ethereum, smart contracts, is being created on Bitcoin via Taproot. And then his next tweet, is the uh, uh, look at me where we are the hornets now. It's the I'm in charge now meme, except he's got the the Bitcoin wizard hat and the wizard beard because this is the, these are the memes of the Bitcoin space. And so this is like, w- look at look at me. We, we're in charge now. Hey, Bitcoin fundamentalists who are like, get your shit coinery out of our chain. Uh, our chain is for Bitcoin. We're in charge. We're in charge now. The builders are in so charge. We have two camps now again. Mm-hmm. And this isn't the first mm-hmm. time that, that Bitcoin has divided into two camps. Nick uh, Carter wrote a great editorial uh, piece uh, about this and, and kind of the, remember the the big blockers and the small blockers? Mm-hmm. Um, this, this was um, back in, you know, the 2017, I think, 2017, 2018 mm-hmm. blockchain, uh, block size wars in, in Bitcoin. And basically the uh, the big blockers went and you know forked off with Bitcoin cash. They went in another direction and the small blockers kept Bitcoin block space uh, smaller and kept it uh, as a premium asset. This is a similar split in the Bitcoin community where you have the the hardcore, I call them maybe Bitcoin maximalists or call them Bitcoin fundamentalists who just, they just think that this kind of activity is beneath Bitcoin, is unholy. Why, thou shalt not hold any other asset but Bitcoin, right? So they don't like any of these these memes, the Ponzi the tokens, they, they hate it, it's, it's impure. And then there's like more Bitcoin pragmatists. Mm-hmm. Which I think it's maybe a larger set of the population, like Eric Wall, like Nick Carter, right. who are like, uh, if we want Bitcoin, the network to succeed, we have to sell block space. Right. That is fundamental. And you don't get to decide right. what the block space is used for. The credible neutrality of Bitcoin just says it you know, provides Bitcoin the block space to the is. highest bidder. It just is. And by the way, this is actually a good thing for the Bitcoin mm-hmm. network because it's a source of economic sustainability into the future as issuance starts to run dry. So these mm-hmm. are the two camps that are kind of competing for cultural mindshare right now. Right. Okay. And like the, the crazy thing is, is like, even when you apply like crypto Bitcoin fundamentalist maxi principles, Eric and Nick are still right. And so here's an Eric tweet. So he goes, 90% of lightning laser eyed maxis use Noster, a centralized custodial lightning uh, provider. And it's just like, you, it's like lit, uh, lightning network, which is deemed holy by the Bitcoin maximalists, except it's centralized and custodial, which is insane. And then he, he continues and goes, 90% of magicians, which is now the name of a tribe, which is how you know it's good because it's got a name, uh, trading ordinals inscriptions using non-custodial trustless PSBT atomic swaps. Uh, I don't know what PSBT is. So basically he's saying, hey, what ordinals is, it's trustless, it's atomic, it is non-custodial, and all of the 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 uh, the holy narratives of Bitcoin, which is you know Lightning Network, is custodial and trusted and just like totally ass backwards. So if you scroll down, his next tweet is so good. Uh, he goes, uh, an IOU Bitcoin equals fiat, which is the custodial Lightning. The laser-eyed maxis are the shit coiners. And he follows again. <laughs> he goes, we built a more trustless, decentralized <laughs> protocol for trading our horribly inefficient ordinal NFTs and BRC20 tokens in two months. You are not even using trustless solutions to send mo- micropayments after seven years. All caps, you failed. Ooh, it's so good. It's so yeah. good. I mean, he's saying one set of users is banked and the other is bankless. I mean, that's exactly basically. right. That's, that's our exactly parlance. Right. And then Amin Soleimani follows up and goes, I discovered this, this payments problem. Amin Soleimani uh, was innovating on uh, payment channels on, on Ethereum uh, when we were trying to figure out how to scale Ethereum. He goes, I discovered this five years ago when I tried to use Ethereum state channels for my cam site. He made Spank Chain. 
Our work helped rule out state channels as a long-term layer two solution, and ETH nerds doubled down on Plasma, which eventually became layer two rollups. And finishes off saying, good to see Bitcoiners catching up, to which Eric Wall responds, lol. Oh, I mean, excuse, this is because me, LMFAO is what he said. Th- this is because um, some Bitcoiners are realizing that Lightning, which uses state channel technology, isn't mm-hmm. all it's cracked up to be. There are a lot mm-hmm. of challenges with it. Right. Um, what uh, What is Michael Saylor saying? Should we play this clip? I think we should play this clip. Michael Saylor right, has an it. interesting take. So I think that what happened with ordinals and NFTs is we crossed this chasm from what was a bearish scenario to a bullish scenario. <laughs> If I was a miner, I would be ecstatic. I think that long term, it, it, there are a lot of implications. Uh, long term, the implication is there's going to be a lot of applications on the Bitcoin base layer. Yeah, you know, if I can inscribe a piece of art, right? An NFT is kind of an art, but I could also inscribe my last will and testament. And if my last will and testament is moving a billion dollars from me to you, how much is it worth to you to have that burned onto the blockchain and cryptographically verified? Yeah, at least a billion dollars for me. Would you pay twenty what bucks? Is this? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, would you pay hundred dollars? Here's a smart contract. There you go. So there are interesting applications. It's funny because so so, so obviously Sailor is team um, not team full not Bitcoin team maximalism. He's right. he's totally okay with this, but it's so funny to like yeah NFTs are fine if they're on my blockchain. Of NFTs course. are fantastic. So are tokens <laughs> if they pump my bags. That. Uh, <laughs> There's some deep uh, hypocrisy here, I think, among some members of the Bitcoin community. I don't see it in Eric Wall, though, or Nick Carter. No. Um, personally, this is a tweet from Nick Carter. Now, if Bitcoin could find a way to return this capital to holders instead of it being siphoned out by miners, so, of course, all the transaction fees going straight to miners. And then lots he follows of transaction up, fees. Lots, lots of revenue. That was the smartest thing ETH ever did, frankly, and I was skeptical of it. ETH, of course, burning Right. Uh, these transaction fees rather than distributing them to uh, to miners and, and stakers. So I, I look, man, they're coming around. Uh, Eric Wall says this is probably the funniest year in Bitcoin ever. Yeah. Uh, I agree. And uh, the, the laser eyed maxis are now the laser eyed reading maxis. And Eric Wall and Nick Carter, the people that I've always been aligned with and always thought were just like on the pinnacle of what this crypto industry is doing, are finally being uh, have the foundation for them to stand on because they couldn't stand up to the cyber hornets without something like the Ordinals protocol supporting them and, and their points and their areas of emphasis. I'm cheering Bitcoin on in this. I'm um, yes. I, I still think what's ironic I've, is I I've still think never enjoyed Bitcoin more than I have in the in the last like month or so. They're still kind of years behind on these things. There's, there's you know still I mean? like, I'm just they like, still are going through their state channels era, dude. <laughs> I don't know if it makes me more bullish on Bitcoin or not, but it is uh it is fun to it's, witness. It's trending uh, in the right direction, that's for sure. This is now a, a bullish Bitcoin podcast, at least semi bull, semi bull. Uh, we need to get to uh, the rest of the show, Ryan. And so coming up next is Brad Sherman's beautiful, beautiful soundbite that will be imprinted in the crypto industry. Somebody should inscribe it into the Bitcoin blockchain. So we're going to get to that <laughs> soundbite as soon as we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially MetaMask for all of the crazy crypto jargon that we use on the podcast. If you don't know what that means, go click the link in the show notes because MetaMask wants you to use MetaMask Learn at learn.metamask.io to learn about Web3 jargon. Go check it out. Learning about crypto is hard until now. Introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, it is still a jargon-free experience for the crypto curious user. Friendly, not scary. MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. 
Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Here it is, guys. Representative Brad Sherman at a US House hearing this week. Here's what he said. Crypto bros make money literally by making money and they've made over a trillion dollars out of thin air. Um, they'll accuse the U.S. government of making money out of thin air. Maybe we do, but we're the U.S. government. <laughs> there it is, David. It's you just bag said it. all the way down. You just said it. It's like, it's not okay when you print money. Right. It's only okay when I print money. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he's saying. Yeah, that's... I don't have another take. That's that's all you have to say. Brad Sherman has more takes. 60 oh, years ago, the late great Robert F. Kennedy went after tax evaders as U.S. Attorney General. Today, his son is slated to speak at a conference for tax evaders. This is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He is going to a Bitcoin conference in Miami Beach. And this is Brad Sherman calling the attendees of this conference tax evaders. Hmm. Those in the okay, crypto it's a industry... Conference for tax evaders. It's a conference for tax evaders, yes. Mm. Um, mm. I don't know about you, David. So that's great for uh, marketing. Uh, by, for, for what it's I worth. pay my taxes, yeah. and it's a big, giant pain in the ass to oh, pay yeah. taxes when uh, you have unclear regulation and unfavorable regulation with mm -hmm. respect to tracking these transactions. Um, and I, and almost everyone I know in crypto also pays their taxes. And for Brad Sherman to just like blanket the right. entire industry and say, anyone who goes to a, like a crypto conference, anyone who's in the crypto industry doesn't pay their taxes. Like, what is this guy doing, man? It's insane, what? man. The, the anti-crypto army of Elizabeth Warren and Brad Sherman are just a bunch of geriatrics, dude. I don't understand. Well, you gotta- uh, <laughs> I can't look at this picture. <laughs> the US government right now, this is a clown photo this is one that of my uh, David tweets. AI generated. Oh, no, that's a real picture, actually. That is uh, photographed. That's a photograph. But this is not a photograph. What are you talking about? Photograph. It's a photograph. It looks just no, like it's it. not. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Um, Lido looks like they are enabling withdrawals. Uh, finally, it's mm -hmm. taken them a while, but, but here we are. What's happening? I guess we can't say uh, the withdrawals is totally over because Lido still needs to enable withdrawals. Uh, and so an on-chain vote going out today, Friday, uh, that will go live if the vote passes on May 15th, uh, will allow for staked Ether withdrawals out of Lido along with some protocol improvements as well. Uh, and so Lido's getting a big upgrade, but the big news is that if there is demand to unstake from Lido, people are free to withdraw from Lido. So we'll, we will see if Lido can hold on to all of the ETH that it has. And that's going to be yeah. a big area of attention next week. Another snow globe uh, shaking event. Uh, how mm -hmm. about Arbitrum? They got some news this week about surplus revenue from transaction fees in the Dow. Yeah, this is really cool. Okay, so very good tweet thread, which we don't have time to go into, but I will summarize it for you, bankless listeners. So all users on Arbitrum 1 pay a fee, of course, when you transact on the network. Arbitrum, just like Ethereum, has a gas fee. This fee is split into two components, an L1 fee that pays for the L1 gas that the Arbitrum network pays to Ethereum to post its data, and also a Layer 2 fee to pay for the Layer 2 network costs. That Layer 2 fee is split into two components itself, one is called uh, the base fee, which is pretty synonymous with the base fee on the layer one, and also a surplus fee, which is like profit uh, on top of that, just for prop making sure the profitable uh, the network is profitable. So the layer one gas fee goes to the layer one sequencer, so the Arbitrum sequencer, fronts the cost of posting data to the blockchain for Arbitrum, and then the layer one base fee goes to, to refund the sequencer for its costs. So at the present amount, uh, the refund is about 6,000 Ether, so the sequencer costs 6,000 Ether, and there is a 
582 Ether surplus that the uh, layer one fees on uh, are not, from Arbitrum, uh, a surplus that was not needed, and so is going to the DAO. And so because the uh, sequencer charged more fees than it needed, a surplus of 582 ETH is going to the DAO. Now, the, go back, going back to the layer two fees, we have the base fee, which accumulated 1,308 Ether is going to the DAO. And then the surplus fee, which is anything on for the congestion, uh, like if, if the model for this is, is contention versus content, con, uh, contention and congestion. This is base fee and surplus fee, but this is Arbitrum terminology. Base fee, 1,308 Ether, surplus fee, 1,462 Ether. All of that going to Arbitrum DAO. So if you tally all of this up, we're getting something like uh, 3,400 Ether-ish, 3,332 Ether going to the Arbitrum DAO. That is profit for is Arbitrum DAO. Is that since DAO. inception for Arbitrum? Or is uh, that, so what's the time period I here? I don't know, actually. That's a good point. Well, what's interesting about this is the model for a, a layer two is basically like a value-added reseller yeah. of Ethereum block space. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting their value on it and then they're charging a profit and that's how layer twos mm -hmm. uh, retain profitability essentially. Now right. Arbitrum is delivering this back to the DAO. Um, right. Very cool. This is a you know, interesting new model. Here, here's a take from Plenia. Um, mm -hmm. An actually economically sustainable protocol in crypto? Crazy talk. Arbitrum DAO netted $6 million. The cost of operation was $11 million. Pretty impressive. Layer twos like Arbitrum mm -hmm. are profitable. Right. Uh, that's good to see. Some and sustainable economics in crypto. When EIP4844 comes in, Ryan, the cost be real of operation drops so big. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, bullish, bullish. Very Brian's bullish. been busy. Brian Armstrong. <laughs> Look at all these photos in uh, the Middle East here with Brian meeting with various folks. What's the story here? Uh, so this is the uh, Brian World Star Bluff Collar Strong Arm segment. <laughs> that one, arm strong, strong arm. So what's, yeah. what, why is Brian tweeting out a picture with the Minister of the Economy of the United States, United States Emirates? He's also meeting with Her Excellent, Excellency SCA CEO, Dr. Miriam, I don't know, uh, somebody in the in Dubai. Uh, also the Minister of State of Foreign Trade. Uh, from the United States of uh, Emirates. And then he tweets out, the UAE deserves a lot of credit for being forward thinking on crypto. First dedicated crypto regulator in the world. Clear rule book, published, uh, very clearly published. Business friendly, strong customer protections. Really enjoying my visit so far. Brian Armstrong, <laughs> absolute world star, going on a world tour, talking to officials in pro crypto countries. Why is he yeah, publicly funny. broadcasting his world starness, Ryan? What do you think is the angle here, perhaps? It's like when you break up with someone and so you start like <laughs> posting pictures of all of these with, with amazing other, with other experiences hotter, hotties, yeah. you've been having. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's kind of like that. I mean, Brian's Brian's like, like look what you're missing. Yeah. I mean, I am a US-based company entrepreneur. These regulators aren't crazy from these other countries. Mm -hmm. And so he's making that very public. I think that's the the signal here. Obviously, there's some expansion reasons that Coinbase sure. is uh, looking at the Middle East, but I think that's a core message and why this mm -hmm. is so public. That's um, exactly right. Okay, moving on. Uh, PayPal has disclosed that it's safeguarding nearly $1 billion in crypto assets, half a billion dollars in Bitcoin, $362 million in ETH. So... PayPal has, uh, uh, for as a custodian, is a billion dollars in customers' crypto. Nice. You know what they're going to want to do next, David, is stake some stake of that it, ETH, stake I'm it. pretty nice. sure. Nice. Uh, Elon Musk is tweeting about miladies. There is no meme. I love you, milady tweet. What does this do to the price of miladies, David, when Elon I, Musk I have it? not looked. I can only imagine it is up. Cool. So the story this week is uh, miladies tweeting by Elon Musk and meme coins, huh? That's what crypto's given us. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, so apparently, Arthur Hayes and <laughs> Suzu got some beef. What are we looking at here? This is a court document. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure it's just Arthur Hayes that has beef with uh, Suzu. So uh, Suzu has filed a restraining order against Arthur Hayes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so the order prohibits Hayes from using threatening, abusive, or insulting words and making any threatening, abusive, or insulting communication that would cause a applicant harassment, harm, or distress. Uh, and so, uh, three arrows capital owes Arthur Hayes, um, uh, bit, oh, excuse me, three owes a billion dollars in individual claims of which Arthur Hayes ha is some of that. And Hayes has just been 
absolutely harassing Suzu on, on Twitter. Uh, and so here's a bunch of tweets uh, in, that Arthur Hayes has that, you know, name a date, time, and location of Kyle and Suzu. I bet some creditors would love to have a chat with them. Followed up with, a little birdie told me Suzu is in Singapore trying to keep a low profile. I know you ain't broke, brah. Come and see daddy and make amends. I won't hurt, I promise. <laughs> kissy face, kissy face, kissy face. Uh, so uh, because of Arthur Hayes's um, posturing to public tweets, he has now a restraining order against Suzu. Come on, and honestly, this looks pretty I, tame I, to me, David. These tweets look tame to me. I don't want, uh, the two times that we've done a podcast with Arthur Hayes, he's been in gym clothes, man, I don't want him, <laughs> I don't want to owe him money. <laughs> I mean, but like, what are these guys doing? I, I, I don't understand unless there's more to it than just these tweets publicly. I mean, you lost people millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, guys. Like with, yeah, fraud. people are going to be upset about that. With fraud. <laughs> they may say mean it's things okay to, to lose you sometimes people's money. on Twitter. It's not okay to do it with fraud. <sighs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here we go. Stripe expanding access to crypto on ramp with a new hosted option. You know what, David? Stripe has been more and more supportive of crypto Big over time. Man. And of yeah. course, they serve a massive amount of uh, merchants through the payments API. Um, it's used by Brave, used by Safe, used by One Inch, used by Lens. I think mm -hmm. this is pretty bullish longer term for crypto adoption. WorldCoin and the beloved Orb finally has a mobile wallet. So if you didn't want to put your eye into the Orb, you could still download the wallet on your phone. Uh, and so WorldCoin app do, is Do released. I have to stick my eye into the phone now? It's like into the app? Uh, no, the, 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 I don't think the app scans your eye. It doesn't have the technology okay. to do that. Okay. Uh, and so um, this is a, just a huge part of the WorldCoin tech stack, which uh, I've been learning about recently, Ryan. And it is, it's a crazy tech stack. Um, I mean, man, it's it's an app. It is this crazy biometrics orb thing. It is a layer two stack. It is a token. Uh, it is, I mean, marketing. It's at a crazy company. Um, anyways, uh, the, the app is out, uh, and that is a very comp a core component of this whole thing. It is the mechanism to which the UBI part of WorldCoin is going to get distributed. I am undecided on WorldCoin. It's very I'm interesting warming to up me to because I like I'm not. I'm leaving the door open for myself personally. It's mm -hmm. It's got some strikes against it. It's very much like a VC type coin. Um, the whole, it's called WorldCoin, David. Like the, what the, the F? branding is the biggest issue about WorldCoin. But if you can get, if you can suspend your disbelief, the WorldCoin story is pretty compelling. I don't know yet. There's, I, there's I'm, like I'm data privacy disbelief, concerns, of course. Yet. Everyone's like, oh, but they got your data. But they actually don't. And, and it's really easy to cancel WorldCoin for like the whole data thing, but they actually don't got your data if I you actually, trust that they don't. <laughs> you gotta I'm trust at that. the point where I want to hear them out though. Yeah. Um, yes. It, like they're making some cool choices too, right? Mm -hmm. I'm building this as a roll up is a cool choice, not doing kind of an L1 chain and like pumping the price of uh, WorldCoin yeah. from the get go. Like, and I know I there's some I have good some engineers there that, too. Actually. Well, should we should we say so? David is doing mm -hmm. an interview with one of the founders of uh, Worldcoin and also oh, Sam Altman. Who? Oh, that wasn't it. But I, that is happening. Yeah. So we are doing a okay. podcast with Sam Altman. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing a we're doing a podcast on Worldcoin. So <laughs> we'll arm the bankless community with mm -hmm. with with some knowledge here uh, from the source, and you guys can make a decision on on like whether this is good or whether this is uh, some dystopian future here. What's your alpha? I got a uh, breakfast with a DC builder from the WorldCoin project, a uh, uh, ZK researcher, uh, researcher at, at the WorldCoin. Uh, and so he, of course, brought the orb with him. So we got put the little orb. Oh, God. Oh, my God. There it is. <laughs> yeah, there did it you is. Stick, right? Did you stick have, anything no, into I, that? I have not been orbed. I did not stick anything into the orb. Dude, uh, see, this is what I mean. This looks so, like, the uh, I've been scary. thinking about this is, like, the worst thing about WorldCoin is that they have this, like, dystopian sci-fi, like, um cosmetic layer to the whole system. Uh, but like, if, okay, they need to scan your iris and, the, and then they <laughs> also need to layer on a bunch of other biometric stuff to make sure that you're not faking it. So the crazy yeah. innovation about the WorldCoin orb is not that it's just an iris scanning mechanism. It's an iris scanning mechanism plus like 18 different layers of anti-fraudulent technology. And so it's a bunch of other scanners as well to make sure so you're you not need trying to hardware game it. like yes, that. So and you hardware. need the hardware to look like something, and it just turns out it's it like some yes. Like there's no friendly way. Like what you what are you gonna do? Like try and turn it into a teddy bear? That's like even worse, right? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so like they, they came up with the silver orb, which I like, I, it's like the, the least bad version of, of how this works. Um, yeah. Anyways, one of the reasons why like me and other people are, have come around slowly to WorldCoin is that people like DC, Builder, gener- generally beloved by the community, did not need to be compelled by WorldCoin. Uh, but uh, like I would call him a credibly neutral builder that got a job at WorldCoin and got compelled by the vision. And uh, there's been a few of those. And so, you know, trusting that they are smart people who are making good decisions. I don't know. There's so many questions still, though, too, including questions. the question of Sam Altman. Yeah. And he's already got some scary yeah. uh, AI tech, yeah. right? Like, uh, at least he's open trying AI. to sp- solve for the problem that he's also creating. Maybe. That's Which why I want to listen. Thing. That's why I want to, I, I am I don't know. in information seeking mode, I would mm-hmm. say about this project. Speaking of uh, solving AI problems, uh, Ethereum attestation service launched a new feature, attest and verify any type of document or file. Why do you need to do this? Because it's going to be increasingly hard to actually attest to the validity and originality of content on the, on, uh, in the world these days. And so with the Ethereum attestation service, you can easily generate a hash of your content and let others verify against the hash to say you are the creator of this content as the originator. Quick news, uh, Bittrex has filed for bankruptcy, Bittrex in the United States. Um, good night, sweet prince. That was my first exchange. Did you know that? Was it really? Yeah, my first, ne- yeah. Never used Bittrex. It was based on um, Also, Blockworks announced a big th- fundraise. So this is the crypto media company that uh, Bankless throws a party with every year, mm-hmm. a conference called Permissionless, which, by the way, party you can get... conference. <laughs> yeah, you can get tickets to right now. Um, this is uh, Yano. We, we got mm-hmm. a lot wrong over the years, but one thing we got right was our early thesis. As crypto grew exponentially, the industry's participants would demand better information, and so they built Blockworks. Blockworks, I feel like, is a crypto media org that's doing a lot of things right. Like I'm a yes. big fan of um, yes. uh, Jason and the team over at Blockworks and, mm-hmm. and Mike and what they're doing. So this is a $12 million raise on a $135 million valuation. Well done. Wow. Well done. Who knew crypto yeah. media companies right. uh, this valuable? <laughs> Impressive. Uh, we're actually, we're doing a Twitter spaces with uh, Jason and Mike, the two founders of Blockworks. So two founders of Bankless, two founders of Blockworks. We're going to talk about crypto media. That's going to be sometime in two weeks from now, unscheduled, um, but that's going to be pretty cool. So mark your calendars, even though I didn't give you a date. Uh, I think that's going to be a really <laughs> interesting conversation. Um, yeah. Crypto media. Yeah. I do too. There's a lot of unique things about crypto that uh, are difficult to get right mm-hmm. when you're talking about media. Uh-huh. Jobs. We got jobs of the week here on the Bankless Jobs Boards. I'm going to whip right through them. Bankless Yee. Ventures needs an investment analyst intern. Sickest job Coinbase in crypto. Needs a staff blockchain engineer and a smart contract engineer. And Phantom needs a software engineer and a software engineer for front end and mobile. Premia needs a Web3 product management architect lead. Dinera needs a smart contract engineer. Uniswap, a whole bunch of jobs too. Oh my God, I can't keep up with all of them, but they're all available for you on the Bankless Jobs Board. That's bankless.palette.com slash jobs. Get a job in crypto. David, what do we have coming up next? Coming up next, we got the questions from the nation. Is Eigenlayer a threat to Ethereum decentralization? We're going to answer that one, as well as the hot takes from crypto Twitter and, of course, the meme of the week, which is extra spicy this week. And we got a moment of zen, which I think is the coolest marketing stunt has ever been done by a crypto exchange. Uh, Kraken uh, funded this guy to scam scam artists. And so stick around (laughs) for the moment of zen. You know Uniswap, it's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Safe, simple custody from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There's a link in the show notes. This first question is from Leaf on Earth. Is Eigenlayer actually a huge danger for ETH decentralization? You've given only the positive side so far, but I found this article quite compelling. He then links, they then link to an article from Galaxy, which is uh, exploring MEV on Eigenlayer, pointing out the, the dangers, look at this, mm-hmm. of uh, cross-domain MEV and how that could be a threat to the decentralization of Ethereum. So 
David, what do you think? We've covered the benefits of eigenlayer. Are we downplaying downplaying the the negatives from it? What would you say to this question? Yeah, I think that this is pretty prescient, and the I would say the answer is pretty clearly yes. Um, is eigenlayer a danger for ETH decentralization? Yes, uh, this is a big. Uh, cause of concern of a lot of uh, the Ethereum core devs, if you will. Um, I know Justin Drake is interested in this. Uh, I know Dankrad is interested in this. Um, and I wouldn't say it's just because of cross-domain MEV. Um, and what that means is MEV across blockchains or across systems. If you are staking on multiple systems, there are MEV opportunities that you would have if you're uh, that are large. Uh, if you uh, compared to if you were just staking on one domain, one one blockchain. So that is one concern. Another concern is that if there's a bunch of networks that you are restaking your ether to. The more networks that you restake your ether to, the more computational resource requirements are needed to do that. Uh, and so, if there are a bunch of networks that you need to restake to, you have to have a bigger and beefier computer. And then also, there's more MEV opportunities if you are validating more blocks. And so, it just tilts towards economies of scale. And so, something like Lido or Coinbase, who has a very large amount of ether staked, are going to be able to have higher yields because they're being going to be able to, to restake and provide more services in a more professionalized manner and be able to get more yields. So people are going to be like, solo staking? I can't compete with Coinbase because they're getting more yield. And so they just stake with Coinbase. So yes, uh, I would say that is a concern. I would say this is a similar level of concern that we felt as an ecosystem at the genesis of MEV. And then what did we do? We spent three years to research to where we are now, which are in protocol solutions that are on the roadmap to solve for this. Um, so I don't think that this is a uh, disastrous problem. It is a problem that does need to be addressed. And so I think Leaf on Earth is very prescient and tuned in to some of the issues here. Yeah, absolutely. It's and it's something that we'll have to address over the years to come. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our Twitter spaces we did as a follow up to the episode with Justin Drake, he actually brought yeah. this up. Yeah. And uh, he thinks that some of the mechanism mechanisms from our episode with respect to like MEV smoothing and MEV burn, some of those same things can be at play in kind of the restaking MEV subset of problems. So uh, I think it's a it's a matter of like the cat and mouse game, right? MEV is a tricky solution. And now it's, it's kind of like migrating. The Moloch problems are kind of migrating to restaking. And so what do we have to do as a community? We have to plug this hole. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe this is the last one we have to plug. <sighs> will probably be others. I think decentralization is not a one-time fight where you like design a protocol and you get it right. It's um, a series of uh, things that you put in place over time to to correct for uh, and, and to propagate decentralization and to prevent centralization. All right, David, let's get to what we're bullish on this week. Uh, how about you, my friend? What are you bullish on? Uh, there is this new project that has not launched, but they have released a bunch of information about what they are working on. It's called Nocturne. Uh, and so this is something that uh, swept the Twitter sphere by storm when they when they released their docs, which is in how you know that people are are uh, tapping into this. What They're is Nocturne? Excited about documents, huh? <laughs> it's so excited about documents. Yeah. So uh, Nocturne is uh, a layer one smart contract uh, that is tapping into innovations in the world of account abstraction to build a private bank account. Uh, is how I would simplify that in a very simple word. Uh, think of like ASIC as a layer two, private layer two, but a private bank account on the layer one, a private smart contract. So privacy using zero knowledge cryptography as a private bank account. And so you can put your money into this single smart contract along with everyone else, but kind of like how Tornado Cash would pool up everyone, but then you would still get to like be, have your claim over your assets. And then the smart contract manages it for you, gives you privacy for people who are all using the bank account. Uh, and that is privacy on the layer one. Seems so simple. I don't know why people haven't built this yet. I guess we just needed innovations in uh, cryptography and, and zero knowledge cryptography, but this is something I'm excited about. Imagine having a private smart contract on the layer one. That's what I'm bullish Yeah, about. because uh, privacy in crypto is largely unsolved. I mean, Bitcoin is completely public. Ethereum is, mm -hmm. is by default completely pu public. And, uh, you know, Aztec is trying to solve it in their, their own layer two. Um, but what about all of the other layer twos that we use in the day-to-day? -day? What about the Ethereum mainnet, right? How do we maintain privacy? Uh, so that's what this solves. And of course, Tornado Cash got recently outlawed for mm -hmm. American citizens. So, um, <laughs> I mean, the surveillance state ain't going to like this one, David, I <laughs> think. I think that's a take here. Um, but we'll have to see how this plays out. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what are you bullish on? Um, I mean, speaking of 
I guess the surveillance state, we had a really interesting conversation recording either earlier this week that I was not expecting. I mean, I knew that the recording was on our calendar. I mean, I wasn't expecting that um, I would enjoy this conversation so much. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was with Rowan Gray, and this is a guest we had on three years ago almost. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to put this guy in a box, like from a worldview you perspective. Don't, you don't know how to categorize him. Don't. He's uncategorizable, if that's a word. He doesn't like crypto. He doesn't love crypto. And three years ago, we almost had him on in, in kind of a debate for some what we perceived as at the time, anti-crypto legislation. Um, We had a debate on kind of the merits of crypto versus what he's proposing. I feel like he's come around. Now he has a healthy respect for crypto, which is different. But like, he's not, um, he's not, I would say, an institutional Republican or an institutional Democrat. Um, I don't, I don't think you could characterize him as being right, but calling him like left is not quite right either Mm -hmm. because he's not like a kind of the neoliberal type left. But let me tell you what he's fighting for. He's fighting for not a CDBC. He hates the term CDBC because he believes it's believe it's been co-opted, co-opted by the central bankers and bankers in general. He's fighting for a digital dollar an e-cash that preserves privacy at the base layer and is available for all citizens of the United States to give um, people who don't have banks, the unbanked, basically a way to preserve a, a cash type instrument as we migrate to the digital economy because dollar bills are going away. I mean, like that's not going to be a form you can use. And so in the absence of that, you're just using like a C- CDBC basically. Like right right now, if you have uh, dollars in your Wells Fargo account, it's almost like a proto CDBC, right? Mm-hmm. Because these are really like dollar IOUs you can't control it. I mean, if if uh, Wells Fargo wants to revoke your access because it doesn't like your political opinion or something like that, um, I mean, they could send you a Dear John letter for any reason, right? And so this kind of gets away from that and it preserves that that civil liberty. And I guess what was interesting in this conversation, David, is um, the common cause we found yeah. with him that I was not quite expecting. It was yeah. almost like a an olive branch from the yeah. com- he called uh, the it an unholy community. alliance, which I think is right. an unholy alliance. And uh-huh. uh, there is some common ground. He he isn't completely on board with everything that crypto is doing. I mean, he's much more. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's much more. David has called him status, and that might be the right term for this. He he thinks that the government is a it's solution a blunt, to far it's more a blunt things. Category for him, yeah. Yes, uh, he thinks the government is a solution to far more public goods than I think you or I would say. Like we would say Ethereum is a public good and he would say it's not a public good, it's an open permissionless network. Right. And that's the public different. is the word for the state. Yes, and yet mm. even with all of those differences, there's some commonality here. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe there's another way that we can mm-hmm. influence um, members in Congress and members of, of government to actually uh, support what we're doing here in crypto. Because we need some allies and particularly I think we need allies uh, in the U S on the, on the Democrat side of things. Right. Um, and where are those allies going to come from? It's going to come from those who want, uh, to bypass the banks and preserve a digital private cash type money system. As we migrate into the digital age, crypto can be a part of that. Maybe his idea of a digital dollar and e-cash is a part of that as well, but there's an alliance in the making there, I think. That, that's, mm-hmm. that's what I'm bullish about. That was mm-hmm. kind of uh, an interesting conversation this week. We have successfully teased three shows on the oh, podcast God, that we? are unreleased <laughs> this week, including the fourth show that was the Justin Drake episode that we released last week. Man, we're good at our jobs. Yes, <laughs> teasing other shows. That's why you come to the roll-up. Uh, let's get yeah. to the meme of the week. David, this is uh, Gary learning about a new term, the term OG. Let's take a listen. Oh, great. Gary? Awesome. So what were the letters you said? O-D? O-G. Like, O-G. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> Does O-G stand for something? I actually don't know what it stands Original, for. Original gangster. Okay. Original gangster. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I actually love old Gary. I miss I love old, old Gary. Gary. This is MIT yeah. Gary, and he was actually good. <laughs> at his, at what, I wouldn't at what have he was doing. his class. No, yeah. it was um, my how things have changed. David, we've got a moment of Zen of the week. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fade out with risks and disclaimers as usual, but why don't you tee this up for us? So there is this uh, streamer on Twitch called Kit Boga, Kit Boga Show. 
Uh, he's famous for scamming scammers. And so scammers will try and scam him and he will record that and turn it into a stream. And then that's, that's what he does. He's a streamer that, that like just sends scammers on a wild goose chase. And so he's partnered up with Kraken and Kraken customized a live environment so it's on Kraken.com, but they made him a fake account. So it looks like he is actually sending Bitcoins. And so the scammers are in on it. And then he just like messes with them and it's hilarious. And so just, it's it, first off, this is a marketing stunt by Kraken. And it's whoever came up with this idea is really creative and is good at their jobs. So props to that person. Uh, and this is hilarious. So that is the moment of, gen, of Zen you are about to hear. Everybody wins, except the scammers. That's how scammers. Uh, we like things. Risk I never disclaimers. knew that scammers could be so vulgar, Ryan. They're rude. <laughs> they are rude. They're not nice yeah. people. They're not nice people. <laughs> who would have Who would have expected this? Risks and disclaimers, guys. All this stuff, crypto we're talking about, it's all risky, of course, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. This scammer thinks I'm about to send him $455,000 worth of Bitcoin, but I typed the wrong wallet address. Why didn't you copy and paste? Might be you typed something wrong. Ah, no, I double checked it. Where is three? That's you. I typed the wrong address. I gave you the right address. Still, still you typed the wrong address. B-G-K-P. Three G-K-P. Where the B is coming from? I don't know. I I, I could have swore. I I know I typed it right. Dumb. Call the support and tell them that was not the right address. How could you mess up this badly? I already gave you the right address. You made the mistake. Why did you do that, Joe? Why'd you pick a three? It looks just like a B. You did it, dumb Literally, you are the most idiotic, most dumb most mother... I have literally no words at the moment. And I'm that much angry. $450,000. Are you serious right now? That money was supposed to go to you!